Welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is Lecture 37, where we'll examine whether Darwin's abominable mystery has been solved. From our prior video, we, um, we mentioned that Charles Darwin was puzzled by the rather late appearance of angiosperms, the, the flowering plants in the fossil record. And he hypothesized that there might be a group of fossil primitive flowering plants that were unknown at the time, possibly in the, in the early Triassic or late uh, Paleozoic, that paleontologists had yet to discover, um, possibly uh, in the southern continents. So in this lecture, we're going to go on a expedition into the fossil record and see if any of the known fossils um, might be the missing link between flowering plants and the naked seed plants, the gymniosperms. All right, we, can, we need to assemble a list of things that we're looking for with these fossils. Now, obviously, we'd like to find a fossilized flower. That's the real kicker. Um, but we'll settle for a fossilized seed with endosperm, a fruit structure around it. Uh, maybe we'll also look for a branching veined leaf, like we saw in some of the, uh, the angiosperms. And uh, maybe, maybe those leaves could probably stand out a little bit better than trying to find a fossilized flower or a seed or fruit uh, with fruit around it. All right, here we go. Now, the first contender of a possible ancestor of flowering plants are a group of fossils discovered in the late Triassic of Texas. Uh, these include the leaf form genus Peloria. Um, and Archaeostrombulus. Now these fossils may represent the same plant, and it would have a cone structure for the reproductive parts. But some researchers have sort of suggested that or reconstructed these plants with uh, sort of florets around these sort of primitive possible flowers with them. So could these plants possibly be those early missing links to flowering plants? Maybe. The leaves of these are rather long. They're veined with parallel veins. Um, they look a little bit more like cycads. The closely related San Miguelia has been interpreted as a specialized sort of cycad by some paleobotanists. Now what we've recovered of these late Triassic uh, fossils is that they, they have both megasporangia, so the female cones and microsporangia if male cones. <clears throat> but these cones resemble in many ways the types of cones that we saw with the Netophyta. So many paleontologists sort of regard many of these Triassic fossils as possible ancestors to plants like Wellwichia that had uh, cones that were male and female parts, um, but also similar to some ephedra and ginkgos as well. So these are all gymniosperms. So we're not quite seeing uh, flowering structures in any of these Triassic fossils. Now perhaps one of the fossil that's been debated the most in the late Triassic is the fossil San Miguelia from southwestern Colorado. It was dis first discovered by the famous paleobotanist Roland Brown who regarded the fossil as a cycad um, and he discovered these very broad leaves with parallel veins and he sort of interpreted it as a, a cycad and here's his reconstruction of what this plant might have looked like. Now later paleontologists have visited the site and have discovered more of the plant. And they started kind of questioning this assignment as a cycad. Um, some specimens show what look like primitive flowers on the central stalks, which made the plant look a little bit more like a flowering plant rather than a cycad. Although others argue that these structures are more similar to the cones that are found in the nudophyte uh, Wellwichia. Now, others saw a strong resemblance of these plants, uh, fossilized plants, to the modern monocot verindium, the corn lily, which has these towering uh, flowers and these broad leaves with parallel veins. Now, the resemblance, uh, they argue that it indicates that it possibly is angiosperm and fairly advanced at that if this is the case. However, there are many skeptics, and no real defining flower has been found of this fossil. The next Triassic fossil is just a fossil leaf from the Triassic of the Richmond Basin in Virginia in the eastern United States. This is Pennelica Triassica, which closely resembles a, a living dicot leaf. So it's got this network of veins and a broad leaf structure. It's 
really out of place in the Triassic when everything was either a conifer with needles or fern fronds. And this broadleaf is really puzzling in the fossil record. And sadly, this is all that we know of this fossilized plant. It would be really great if we had more rather than just a leaf. But it does indicate that there is a possibility that angiosperms might be present in the late Triassic. Now, no fossil plants that look like flowering plants are known in the Jurassic. And the first celebrated basal flower flowering plants are known from the early Cretaceous, when most botanists believe they arose. And indeed, the fossil record gets better. This is Archaea fruchius from the early Cretaceous of China. It has many small leaves and these delicate sort of tube-like flowers, while many specimens actually lack flowers. When it was first discovered, it made the cover of Science magazine. The reconstructions of Archaea fruchius have two uh, morphs uh, of flowers. So one is the pollen producing, and the other is these female flowers. Now the flowers are really primitive. They don't have really discrete uh, petals, per se, and the leaves of the plant are small. It's believed it's an aquatic plant, indicating that the pollen was released in the water and floated in the, into open flower-like structures. Now, these fossils are actually found in the same formation as many of the famous early feathered dinosaurs. Now, more recent study of these specimens show that they form these peed pods of seeds, which is similar to many legumes living today. These seed pods are formed with endosperms, similar to modern angiosperms. And I think this is the strongest evidence that these particular Cretaceous fossils are indeed early flowering plants, or at least very closely related to them. Now, there are other fossils from the same formation. This includes uh, Hyrathia, which has these really interesting uh, fruiting structures. Again, showing evidence for early fruit in the fossil record. So we see the first uh, feathered dinosaurs and the first fruit at the same time in the fossil record. Another early contender of the earliest angiosperm was recently described in 2015. This is Machichia from the early Cretaceous of Spain. Now, there are many specimens known of this fossil which shows two different morphs, uh, possibly male and female plants, and they're believed to be aquatic plants. What got researchers excited about these fossil plants are what appear to be seeds at the end of the forms of one of the forms of the fossil plants. Now these seeds are really small, they're kind of pointed, and studying them seems to suggest that they might represent a fruiting structure rather than just a plain old seed like we see with uh, geniosperms. Now the authors of this paper um, have argued that it's closely related to the angiosperm ceratophyllum, which is an aquatic plant. Now, Ceratophytum was once part of the water lily group, um, but more recent molecular phylogenies indicate that it is a little bit higher up in the angiosperm tree based on a number of these molecular characteristics. Now, if Monichia is really closely related to this really specialized aquatic angiosperm, Ceratophyllum, it would indicate a, sort of an unknown diverse group of angiosperms that are that are missing from the fossil record. However, I'm a bit skeptical that Monichia is a member of the angiosperms. So take a look here. We have the cone structure of a female plant of ephedra, uh, which in many ways resembles that of the fossil Monichia. So I'm wondering instead if maybe Monichia uh, represents a netophyte that has returned back to the water. It does not discount, discount that this fossil is an ancestor to flowering plants. But I sure would like to see an actual flower, a fossil flower, with pretty petals and a stamen, you know, the whole thing, a beautiful fossil flower. And boom, you get it in the late Cretaceous, and you have these just wonderful fossil flowers. This is an unmistakable fossil flower. This is Antia coplia uh, from central Georgia in the late Cretaceous, a late San Antonian, and this is this is just a glorious, beautiful flower. So this fossil is a is acid prep fossil that's found in, in coal in coal deposits, and it's just amazing. I mean, this is beautiful, and this is this is what we're lacking um, before the late Cretaceous. We're lacking anything that resembles a flower. This is a flower. Everybody recognizes this as a flower, and so none of these other primitive plants that I've mentioned 
have something that looks like this. It looks like a flower. Now, one of the most remarkable transformations of the world's flora occurred during the late Cretaceous, as angiosperms quickly became the dominant group of plants. The diversity exploded, and by the late Cretaceous, for example, in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana, angiosperm fossil leaves are everywhere. And into the Cenozoic, the flowering plants are just super diverse. So we've not really solved Darwin's mystery. There does appear to be some possible primitive flowering plants in the fossil record prior to the late Cretaceous, a few that have distinct fruiting structures, and a few with broad-veined leaves. But flowers don't appear with their modern morphology and shape until the late Cretaceous. And we're still looking for a possible fossil angiosperm in the Triassic or Jurassic or even earlier. So this leads us to ask, why do flowering plants, the angiosperms, not appear in the fossil record until the late Cretaceous? Well, there's two reasons depending on your view. First is that they evolved for the first time during the early Cretaceous. Or they evolved earlier, but we've just not have found their fossils yet in the Triassic or Jurassic. The fossil record is not as good. All right, so let's suppose that, that Darwin was right. The angiosperms evolved early in the Triassic. So well, let's imagine that, uh, that they evolved maybe like in that locality in Richmond, Virginia, in the Rift Valley that began to appear as the continents were separating in the late Triassic. This is near the equator where it'd be warm and wet, a, a lush tropical forest. These plants would have to survive the mass extinction at the Triassic-Jurassic uh, boundary event, and this may have reduced their numbers quite, quite dramatically. And then as the continents uh, moved away from the equator in the Jurassic, the land mass would become drier and drier, and the semi-arid tropics of South America and North Africa would be the only refugia for these early proto-angiosperms. Then in the Cretaceous, the landscape would become both warm and wet over much of the landmass, and suddenly these few holdovers diversified all of a sudden. And this is, this is a story that might help still keep Darwin's hypothesis alive, but it's, it's not without its problems. For example, was the Jurassic so dry and inhospitable? I mean, here in North America, we have the Jurassic Morrison Formation. It has an abundance of fossil plants and ferns and cycads and conifers and ginkgos and horsetails, but it has nothing like any early angiosperm in sight. Yet these other fossil plants are not particularly dry living desert plants. Many need to be fairly wet and warm environments to live in. Yet you don't see any angiosperms. This is really puzzling. Um, Maybe the first idea is right. Maybe angiosperms appear in the late Cretaceous, evolving from a flowering netophyte that's producing fruit and seeds that are pollinated from insects of the late Cretaceous. So this is a wonderful mystery, and it can only be solved by looking for fossils. Thanks for watching another lecture video. If you'd like to learn more about taking a class at Utah State University in geology, I'll log into our website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and my own research, check out my webpage at benjaminslashberger.org. Thanks for watching.